Good evening. I'm Jim Whaley. Tonight on Cinema Showcase, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be able to welcome the First Lady of the American Theater, Miss Helen Hayes. Her many memorable performances on the stage and screen are legendary, and she has won practically every award that can be given. She has just made one of her rare film appearances in a new motion picture for Walt Disney Productions called Herbie Rides Again, and she's here tonight to talk about that and hopefully some of her other great triumphs. So join me tonight as I talk with Helen Hayes on Cinema Showcase. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's program. Ms. Hayes, may I extend to you a very warm welcome to Cinema Showcase and to Atlanta. Thank you. It's a pleasure having you here. I know you don't do many films, so there, there must be something kind of special about Herbie Rides Again. First of all, I guess it's just wonderful family entertainment, isn't it? That's the first consideration. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, I've always wanted to do a film with Disney, mm -hmm. with the Disney organization. I love it very much. I was a great devotee of Walt Disney as a person. Yes. I loved him. And uh, twice before we tried to get me in the film, I, I couldn't make it either time yeah. while Walt was alive. And now, unfortunately, my first chance to get into one of his films is after he's gone. I had read a story that you did a, a bit part in a Disney film with your son. I is got that into him? that, yes. Yeah. So, uh, Walt at least saw that. Yeah. We were all over in um, Zermatt in Switzerland when Jim my son James MacArthur was doing uh, uh, Third Man on the Mountain, right. and uh, I had taken his then fiance over to visit him for a couple of weeks, and I got uh, uh, into that picture, short scene. Yeah. Do you think, you mentioned that this was the first consideration for this film, that it's family entertainment. Do you see that at all coming back in today's films? I hope I, uh, that the, the, there are more and more um, attempts to. Uh, uh, make family films. I hope so. Yeah. I don't think that this um, great new fad for the for shock and horror and blood and disgusting uh, <laughs> pictures yeah. about rats and things. I and now there's a one about bats. Yeah. I just hope that that isn't going to keep on because uh, I think that we're going to lose the whole picture audience. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that has always been a, a big complaint of mine. It seems like uh, uh, in the, well, in the 30s and 40s in particular, the stories seem to be geared to a kind of, uh, I don't want to say wholesome because that sounds too cliched, uh, but I think you know what I mean. They were exciting without shocking, isn't yeah, that what yeah, you mean? Yeah, that's exactly and what I mean. And I don't know where we got into this uh, rut of uh, shock, shock, yeah. shock. Uh, either in, it's either in sex or in violence, but it's, uh, it's shock. And that's all we seem to know anymore is just shock value. Yeah. But there's a lot of other ways of attracting people and, um, and entertaining or even exciting them mm -hmm. uh, than, um, than through shock. Yeah. I know it's always difficult to uh, synopsize a, a story, but could you tell us, for those who haven't seen Herbie Rides again, a little bit about the story? Well, you know, I really feel that Herbie is the Peter Pan of our time. <laughs> well, it's true, yeah. because you couldn't make the world, the youngsters who uh, live in this world that has gone in the direction it has today, they live in, a, in a, mecha a mechanized world, and they wouldn't get worked up about Peter Pan, a little boy who didn't want to grow up. That's a kind of a t difficult thing to sell them. Mm -hmm. But Herbie is just like Peter Pan in that he, he um, he creates miracles. He just does mir miraculous things. He's a Volkswagen who has a spirit and can act on his own. And uh, in this particular picture, he uh, saves the old firehouse in which Grandma Steinmetz, played by me, uh, lives, and which a wicked realtor, played by Keenan Wynn, is trying to uh, bulldoze to powder. He wants to tear it down and put up a, a big uh, um, office building, you know, a high rise. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that appealed to me because I'm very wrapped up in preservation, trying to keep a little bit in touch and keep a hold on what's left of our heritage. Wonderful. 
We haven't left much of it, but uh, what we have is very precious. In fact, there's just been a story recently that um, a very fine theater we have here in Atlanta may be gone. That's the Fox. You mean the Fox? Yeah. Well, now I think you people are trying to fight that, and aren't you? I think you? we I'm are, all in and favor I, of I it. hope we succeed, too. Yes. So. I know that that uh, work for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, mm -hmm. and when I was coming out on this tour for the Disney picture, they sent me a little stack of... Um, of slides, which I forgot to bring over here mm -hmm. today, but the uh, slides depict that Fox Theater in Atlanta, which is doomed, mm -hmm. but which the uh, citizens are trying to help. Yeah. So you see, they know about you way down in Washington Wonderful. at the National Trust. That's a very valuable thing you're doing, too. I, I wish you much success with that. Thank you. Could you tell me a little something about the uh, supporting cast in Herbie Ryan's again? You have a lot of Wonderful character yes, actors in it. Yes, beautiful. Um, well, we have those two divine young people, Stephanie Powers, mm -hmm. beautiful girl, and so funny and so talented. Yeah. And uh, we have a divine scene together in which we, um, we use the only weapon at hand when we're trying to hold the uh, villains off from the firehouse. They're trying to ride in on us in their bulldozers, so we turn the fire hose on them. <laughs> and two elderly actors getting r loose with a fire hose, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> but we loved it. And, um, and of course, Keenan Wynn, yeah. as I mentioned before, is the villain. And Raymond Bailey, who is a favorite of mine, is in this. Yes. Yeah. Many remember him, I guess, from the Beverly Hillbillies. Billies, so, yes. Yeah. But he's wonderful. Fun. You have brought with you a scene from the film. Does this need any setting up? I think not. It, uh, it, it, it's just a one round in the, in the battle between uh, the villain, Mr. Hawks, and mm -hmm. me, uh, Mrs. Steinmetz, which is won that round, as usual, by Herbie. He just steps in there and takes over. So that's what you're going to see. All right. Let's take a look at a scene right now from the new motion picture starring Helen Hayes, Walt Disney Productions, Herbie Rides Again. Believe me, Mr. Hawk has your best interests at heart. Now, I have an agreement here. If you would just glance at it, oh, I'm Nicole, sure... Oh, Nicole! I want you to meet a gentleman from Mr. Hawk's. How do you do? <laughs> oh, such a nice young man. So they're bothering us again, are they? A little old lady living in a place like that? Who looks out for her? How does she get around? She has a little car she goes everywhere in. Well, you fellas go and pick it up! Yes, Mr. Hawk. Bunch of lame brains. Come along, Herbie. Off to market. Thank you, Herbie. Were you sighted the car, Mr. Hawk? They're moving in for the kill now. Will do of your shortcuts, Herbie. Where is she now? She's still going up and up. It's incredible. She's driving like a madman. <laughs> oh, Herbie, behave yourself. You knock my glasses off. Well, where on earth is she? Excuse me, could you tell me where Mr. Hawk's office is? Yes, ma'am. The old buzzard hangs out 28 stories up, six windows to the left. Thank you so much. Check in the mail to Lusgarden. That's Lusgarden Wrecking Company. Uh, a thousand on account. Tonight he's gonna smash that crummy old firehouse to matchwood. 
<laughs> That'll teach that old battle axe a lesson. <laughs> A scene from Herbie <laughs> Rice again. That, that <laughs> Isn't was it wonderful. Adorable? It really is. What you know, when uh, the producer of this picture and writer of it, Bill Walsh, mm -hmm. first saw it um, cut together, completed with music and the whole works, he wrote me a letter, and I thought it had such a wonderful line in it, which <clears throat> for me was, a, was the Disney philosophy. He said, I think we have a, a good little picture. Uh, it's a bit hokey at times, but then I never thought of hokum as a dirty word. Pretentious? Now there's a no-no. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a well, nice that really uh, phrase for, for the Disney philosophy? Yeah, yeah. In fact, it's very similar to something Frank Capra told me, that uh, people have often accused him of putting so much sentiment in his pictures, and he said he's never found anything wrong with sentiment. No. You know. And uh, when I was watching them uh, playing that, uh, you know, the, the soap suds mm -hmm. going on, Mr. Uh, on, on Mr. Hawks, I, uh, I was so in heaven when I yeah. read that on the script, uh. and then when I got to do it, oh, <laughs> what bliss. You have a very good director on this picture, too, Robert Stevenson. He's, uh, he is a darling. What does he like to work with? Just the most charming man, and, and uh, he does really guide you. He really directs, but he doesn't make a big act out of it. Mm -hmm which a lot of the modern directors do. Too many of them consider themselves uh, geniuses, mm -hmm. the television and movie directors of today. Yeah. Let me ask you about some of your... Um, you have done so many marvelous things on stage and in films, it would be, I think, pointless to try to, uh, to cover your career. But if we could just kind of touch a few of, of the high spots. I know you started out as a child actress. Do you recall any of your, your earliest roles as a child? Oh, I recall those better than the later really? ones, yes. <laughs> Naturally, that's what happens to you as you what get was old. Your, what was your first, uh, your My first role? My first New York... Oh, well, that, that was in uh, those, one of those great uh, stock companies. You know, in the old days, there used to be stock companies all over America, mm -hmm. and they were very fine. Some very important actors were in them. But I was in... Um, uh, a, it was a play called A Royal Family. That was my debut, and I was mm -hmm. all of... Six, I think, oh and I played little Prince Charles, <laughs> and I got to eat two pieces of orange cake every performance, eight times a week, <laughs> and I thought then that the theater was a magical world. Yes. I know George Tyler was a great influence on your career, but mm -hmm. this association began later, didn't it? When did that... My first great help in the theater, the first man to, uh, and I think the man who really discovered me and put me on the Broadway stage was a, a comic, Lou Fields, mm -hmm. who, who was famous as, uh, with Weber, his partner, Weber, Weber and Fields. Field. <coughs> they were the German comics yeah. they did. And, uh, <coughs> and then when they broke up, Lou Fields produced his own shows, and he put me in a show because he had seen me in Washington. Mm -hmm. And he was impressed. And so two years later, he remembered me and put me in this uh, thing called Old Dutch. Mm -hmm. And you know that that had a score by Victor Herbert. My goodness. And Victor Herbert conducted the orchestra on our oh. opening night. Isn't that marvelous? That is, yes. Yes. And, uh, well, when did Tyler, uh, when did George Tyler enter the... Uh, he entered the uh, scene about uh, at nine years later. Yeah. You were doing Pollyanna, was it? I, put, was that the I first? did Pollyanna yeah. for him yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. when I was 17. Mm -hmm. During these early years of your career, do you think it was, in looking back on it now, do you think it was wise that you started out as a child? Did you learn a lot? I certainly did. I got a very good schooling in every direction, not only in theater, because the actors taught me my Shakespeare and taught me a lot of wonderful things connected with theater. Mm -hmm. um, John Drew, with whom I played when I was about 12, a f 
very fine and uh, elegant actor. He was the, the uncle of Ethel and mm. John Barrymore, etc. Now, he taught me French. I, I still have the book, uh, Jean d'Arc, that he gave me and signed, uh, he, that he read aloud to me when we were, when I was touring mm. with him in a play. And uh, William Gillette taught me my American history. <coughs> he was very, very much of an American history buff. Yeah. <coughs> and of course, you know, he wrote the famous play that's now having a great success in London again, yeah. Sherlock Holmes. Right. He was the... Uh, he, uh, well, anyway, uh, these people all taught me something. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I got a fine education being in the theater, as, and I did learn my trade, I think. So many young actors today seem to put down technique. Uh, how important do you think it is, uh, the All acquiring important. and development of technique? Really? All important. I happen to have played with one of the great actresses of the method, the um, actor studio. and. Uh, she was one of our finest actresses. She is now has such mental and nervous disorders that she is no longer in the theater, and she's a relatively young woman. Mm -hmm. And when we were playing together in the O'Neill play, A Touch of the Poet, she struggled hard to stay with us and to stay with that play, which in which she'd had an enormous success. But she simply couldn't. She had no basis of technique. She was so frightened every mm. night when she went on the stage. You see, it's technique that you use when you don't feel the inspiration. Mm -hmm. You have to have something to supply uh, instead of the inspiration, and you can't be inspired every night. Exactly. That would be, uh, uh, they try. Yeah. Uh, this wonderful actress tried every night to work herself up into a state of, of emotional uh, madness, you see, for this uh, very emotional play. And of course, it destroyed her. Mm. Uh, so, all important, I, I yeah. reiterate. Let me ask you about your, uh, your entry into films. I know this came about in the early 1930s um, at MGM. How did, how did this start? It started because mm -hmm. I wanted to be with my husband. Yeah, he, was, uh, he and Ben Hecht were, su I suppose, the, the greatest uh, film writers of their day. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you just said while we were waiting to go on that they wrote your favorite film, yes, one of your very Heights. favorite, yes. Wuthering Heights. Wasn't that a beautiful, beautiful thing they did with that? And um, anyhow, uh, they were out there at Metro Goldwyn Mayer under a big contract and uh, uh, writing all those fabulous pictures. And and it meant that there was a separation of our family. Our little girl was only three years old, and there was Charlie out there, and there was I in New York. <coughs> working in a play. So he had his great friend, Irving Thalberg, who was then head of production at M MGM, mm -hmm. sign me on a contract. I just went out there because Irving wanted to keep Charlie happy. That's how I got a contract. <laughs> and you wound up by winning an Academy Award for your first film. Yes. Right? Well, that was because Charlie wrote that film. Yes. He wanted to establish me, and he wanted to make me happy. So he wrote a role that was written to order for me to measure, mm -hmm. and uh, and it won me an Academy Award. It was really his award. Well, you know, Irving Thalberg to this day is considered, I think, the, the boy genius of Hollywood. What were your impressions of it? Just that. Mm -hmm. I never used the word genius uh, loosely. <coughs> um, I don't think I've met more than two or three geniuses in my time in the theater. One was Lorette Taylor, and another was Laurence Olivier mm -hmm. over in uh, in London and Irving and maybe one or two others that could approach the, that uh, title. But uh, he was the great star maker. Mm -hmm. He knew just how to handle the people that had the promise of stardom. And I think that that was the greatest help that pictures have ever had mm -hmm. was the making of stars. Yeah, which today we really don't have. I anymore. know it, and we need it so badly. Yeah. When I saw your wonderful Hank Aarons, I know that uh, here in, uh, in uh, the South, he is mm -hmm. a great idol because he's with the Atlanta Braves. And um, when I saw him addressing Congress the other day and doing it so beautifully, he knows how to carry the mantle of mm -hmm. greatness, that fellow. Um, he knows how to be a fine champion in mm -hmm. what he does. And uh, I thought, 
Now, that shows how much we need idols, that the Congress had the good sense at this rather bleak time in our career, in our history, to bring that young man forward to make mm -hmm. that speech. It, it just, I'm, I sat with the tears in my eyes listening to him and mm -hmm. watching him. We want someone to worship. Yeah. We have to have it. And we did have in the film stars once upon a time. But I think we lost that with the demise of the studio system. And I wonder if the studio system will ever come back I to doubt the degree. It. You know how you know what caused that demise? What? The actors. Mm -hmm. We liberated ourselves from the star system. We were going to be our own bosses. Well, you cannot be a, a built into a big star position on your own. You just can't do it. Actors are must just rely on their talent to mm -hmm. act and not try to be everything else. Leave the business aspect to somebody else then, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Let me ask you about uh, your preparation for a role. This would apply not only to the stage, but to the screen. Do you research a role, for example, on stage when you were doing Mary of Scotland or Victoria, Victoria Regina. Regina? Yes. No, it was in Mary of Scotland that I learned a little lesson from the, um, the man who wrote it. He wrote it, uh, <coughs> Maxwell Anderson wrote it for me. And uh, when I read it, I said, Max, dear, I cannot do this role because this was the tallest queen in history and I'm the shortest <laughs> actress known to the American theater. And uh, it's just, I can't get together with this role. And he said, you're not to think about history. You're not to think about what she really was. You're to think about what I wrote her to be. And uh, you're to play this role in my play uh, as I have conceived it. And uh, from <coughs> then on, I did many other uh, uh, historical roles, Harriet Beecher Stone, of course, Victoria Regina, and mm -hmm. even, uh, even uh, Shaw's Cleopatra I did. Mm -hmm. I always followed the author's concept and not history. Mm -hmm. I must confess that when the role was over and I'd left the role, then I plunged into <laughs> research because I wanted to find out just what these women were really like. Yeah, that, that's so fascinating because it is in uh, direct opposition to the method where um, everyone does all of this voluminous research and becomes the person, so to speak, you know, but uh, if that's the way Helen Hayes does it, I think we can say that that's a safe way to do it. So. I think the method had a lot of, did a lot of harm to our theater because mm -hmm. it, it made the actor all important mm -hmm. and it rather uh, dismissed the playwright and you see the result of 20, 25 years of that system, mm -hmm. uh, that method. Uh, the playwright ha is almost non-existent now mm. in the theater. Uh, it's a very difficult way of life, writing plays, mm. because it, it's easier to write a novel or a book because you're, uh, there it is. It goes out to the world as you've done it. But a play has to be filtered through actors and mm -hmm. through other talents. and. Um, and so an, a playwright should have every consideration. And uh, they did dismiss playwrights. Uh, this same actress that I told you about before, who was a method actress, I know that she would, uh, we were playing a Eugene O'Neill play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I played, approached him on tiptoe in awe. It was Eugene O'Neill, it was our greatest playwright. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, she would change lines. They, I don't feel like saying it that way. That isn't the way I would say it. You see, that, that's the method. Mm. How do you go about uh, selecting the plays you do? I the read films? them. I fall in love with them, or I don't. The ones I don't, I don't do. <laughs> I've made some mistakes that way, but I, that's the only way I know to, to uh, choose a play. Yeah. You once said, and maybe you could tell me what this means, that you have the subway method. Could you tell me a little bit about what you meant by that? I, I meant that when I was a little girl, before I'd ever gone to any of these teachers that mm -hmm. I eventually went to, I used to, my mother and I lived quite far away from the theaters in which I played in New York, and we'd take the subway back and forth. And she was forever nudging me and saying, don't stare, Helen. I guess she was afraid somebody would take offense. Uh, uh, but I would stare at the people and wonder why they behaved as they did. I tried to 
project myself back into their lives. I still do it. Mm -hmm. I can't look at anybody without wondering exactly what kind of life they lead yeah. and why they walk a certain way or, or hold their head this way or that way. I don't know. It's, and I didn't know what I was doing at the time. It was just curiosity. Mm -hmm. But it was really storing up um, material for performances. Mm -hmm. For instance, I had a play called Coquette that was a great success, and when I heard that my lover had been shot and killed by my father, I, I doubled up like a jackknife, grabbed my stomach and doubled up, and I, I, it, was, it, it was remarked as a wonderful thing to do. Now, I did it instinctively, but a long time afterward, I knew where I'd got that. I had seen a photograph in a newspaper in New York of a mother of a young gangster standing at his grave, and she was doubled up like this, and, mm -hmm. that, and that had made that impression on me. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. We're uh, running out of time, and I wanted to talk about uh, a favorite film, and that is Airport. Uh, won you, of course, your second Academy Award. Was this um, an enjoyable experience for you? Every moment of it, yeah. because I was working with our mutual friend and George enthusiasm, Seaton. George Seaton. Yeah. He's a great director. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, too, about, about television. At one time, television was considered to be a good training ground for young actors. Do you think it is anymore, or has this passed, or was it ever? I think we've misused it so badly. I was appalled, and so was my partner, Mildred Natwick, when we were doing our television mini-series, mm -hmm. I think they call it, uh, The Snoop Sisters. Yeah. We didn't have scripts. We didn't. Well, the whole thing was just a shambles. What do they call it? Controlled chaos. <laughs> well, it isn't controlled anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's just chaos. So you would still say that the the stage is the best the best training ground a young actor could receive. Yes. Absolutely. I think so, and uh, I think films are um, more and more a good training ground. Mm-hmm. Well, we are out of time. I can't thank you enough for coming by, and I want to urge everybody to see Herbie Rides again because it is a delightful film, and if you're in Atlanta again, would you come back and see us again? Yes, I'll come back on the next film. Fine. Which will be? Do you know yet? Yes. I'm doing a film for Disney in London this, uh, this uh, July. Wonderful. And it's, uh, it's called One of Our Dinosaurs is Missing, ah. <laughs> and my co-star will be Peter Ustinov. Wonderful. We'll look forward to that in advance, so thank, thank you again for coming. Thank you. My thanks to all of you for watching. Until next time, good night.